I really would like to welcome you back and uh, of course looking forward what we have to expect immediately in the future and what is the state of play at the moment. This is what we would like to discuss now. You see with me four important political leaders from different parts from Europe and I think uh, we have to use this opportunity just to learn more about the different challenges ahead of us. So, talking in the morning about uh, this bigger picture, if we are now looking more deeply about uh, the migration issues, what we can see is uh, a new phase what is happening. On the one hand, we have the very well-known drivers of migration. This has not changed. We, we know how this is. Uh, of course, the numbers are higher than before, but yeah, we can deal with that. But on the other hand, we have very new issues coming up, unexpected events with a lot of consequences. And this is the mixture, mixture what we have uh, to face at the moment. Uh, this is really something we have been talking about in the morning. Multi-phased uh, polycrisis. So I think uh, this is really one of the big challenges, what we have to see at the moment. And of course, what we would like to see is uh, how in different parts of Europe, this crisis is uh, opening new channels. What is the main issue about it? how is it received in the different countries and what kind of reactions we need and uh, lessons learned for new developments in the future. So with that, I would like to start to hear now from our panelists what is their point of view. And I would like to start uh, my first round with uh, the Deputy Minister of Interior, Arnoldas Abramitius. Uh, he comes from Lithuania and uh, he is a person who is dealing with migration on a daily business. But anyhow, I think if you look to the landscape of Europe, Lithuania was not so much affected in the last years. But with first time the crisis in Belarus, when people uh, have been instrumentalized to come to Europe, Lithuania got to the focus of European Union. And of course, with the war in Ukraine, you are affected also in big numbers, of refugees coming from Ukraine, and you have to do a lot on your border side. You have been also reacting, you have been doing a lot, uh, uh, building up fences uh, just to get control over the border side. But we would like, of course, to hear your point of view, especially concerning Ukraine crisis and the refugees being in your country. Please, Minister, Deputy Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. So, ladies and gentlemen, of course, uh, uh, we faced with a new situation, um, kind of uh, a kind of new type of migration we never experienced uh, until uh, crisis erupt last year. Definitely, from the very beginning, we have supported uh, Belarusian opposition and their human rights issue in that country and uh, help uh, Belarusian opposition uh, to, to move to European Union, to Lithuania, to, to, to other countries. So, uh, regime revenge. Regime revenge and very openly uh, Lukashenko declared I will flood Europe with migrants and drugs. So it hasn't happened with drugs. Uh, there's no uh, much uh, records uh, officially, but uh, definitely, definitely, uh, this is a classical uh, pattern of instrumentalization. In the few weeks, he arranged uh, special travel agencies, uh, especially in the Middle East countries, especially in Iraq. Uh, with the special uh, air flights from Iraq, direct air flights, uh, visa-free. At the very beginning, it was visa system, but visa on spot at the airport. 
and uh, later uh, and later visa free issues so uh, so definitely we was not prepared for such situation and what we have did uh, we have alarmed on the very on the different levels on the european level first of all uh, the council of uh, home affairs that this new issue and the whole europe need to react so that happened and uh, those measures we have taken and uh, some legislation uh, measures as well uh, decision to construct physical barrier and surveillance systems because uh, because we are living in uh, in the world with unpredictable neighbors so as we see from now last year that was the first stage of uh, of a hybrid attack on the hybrid aggression on my country as well as the whole Europe, of whole European Union. But uh, what happened this year, uh, February, uh, February declaring of special war operation, special military operation in Ukraine. So it uh, turns into the conventional war Europe never experienced since the Second World War. And so that happened that they, uh, and Belarus and Russia, they, they acting uh, close allies. And uh, the target is the same, to make as much as more trouble to the European society. Of course, the first wave, the uh, Belarusian wave, hasn't been, let's say, huge in the European terms, at what Europe experienced in 2015, 2016. But anyway, that was a, a classical uh, example how to make it possible within days, within one week or something. So now, new situation, it turns toward a conventional war in Europe and the huge, uh, a uh, huge um, number of refugees uh, from Ukraine. But this time, uh, uh, Europe acted very solidarity in, in solidarity, and uh, uh, within the two weeks, the uh, Council uh, adopted, um, taken to force uh, directive on temporary protection, and uh, it goes uh, smoothly, the, the system. And in this time, my country, accepting uh, more than 67,000 of uh, refugees and uh, uh, those Ukrainians who get the temporary protection. And this time, uh, uh, Lithuania society, whole society shows uh, enormous solidarity to, to, the, to the refugees from, from Ukraine. And um, ratio uh, towards population in one of the highest in, in, in European Union. Uh, my country is more than two and a half percent of population already come uh, increased uh, in, in Lithuania by the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian uh, citizens. That's uh, that's one of the biggest uh, uh, biggest percentage uh, in in whole European Union. So uh, what I want to stress that. Uh, the situation uh, with the unpredictable and hostile regimes uh, need to, for us to be better prepared on the different level, on the national level, first of all, and as well how to react on the European Union level uh, to, uh, to prepare some regulations and, and, and some uh, legal acts to prevent that it was yesterday during the, uh, the dinner was the commissioner mentioned that we do need to find good balance between the uh, security and solidarity. It, has, it hasn't happened uh, yet, but uh, we're going uh, towards that situation. So definitely, uh, definitely uh, the lessons learned from the situation, now we are much better prepared, but not enough prepared. The common approach, uh, how to prevent uh, violation of, of, of a common asylum policy, it's, it's a uh, very important legal solution need to be taken. And of course, European Commission now preparing some, some documents. Maybe we'll talk later about, uh, about those, those issues. Uh, but anyway, uh, lessons we learned help us uh, much, much better prepared. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Uh, I think uh, what we would also like to hear from you, and this is a small 
uh, question is uh, this reaction from European Union. Um, Vice President Skinas went into uh, the different countries of origin. Uh, how was this felt in your country? Because this was crucial to end up with this pressure from Belarus. Uh, could you give us some uh, insights? Uh, what was the debate in your country at that time concerning European engagement? Sure. Uh, as, as I mentioned, first of all, we alarmed uh, to all the European Union institutions that uh, a new crisis uh, has coming, has coming uh, from 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 Belarusian side. But what is uh, a determination of uh, hybrid aggression? So, what does it mean hybrid? Uh, because all re every possible response is under criticism. So, if we would open the borders and say, okay, we uh, we inviting everybody, it would be it would be turns into the big, uh, let's say, <laughs> debate and, and, and uh, resistance from the society because we as a government need to protect them. So it's, if we will, uh, let's say, would be more strict on uh, entering on the asylum procedures, uh, it would be criticized from the uh, human rights organization and from NGOs. So definitely such regimes, they're targeting that all the responses are under criticism. So uh, once I want to reiterate, we need to find uh, proper balance. We need to find proper balance uh, to ensure security of the country and, uh, and uh, let's say, uh, convince uh, no, and reiterate the rights of, of asylum. So situation was very, very difficult in that time. Uh, and that time, uh, but now lessons learned as well. And the society, they, uh, they learned those lessons that uh, we need to uh, follow the, the, the human rights. We need to follow the rights of the uh, of, of, of those who uh, who, who coming, or who, who asking for asylum. So it's uh, it's as much more complicated, uh, but uh, we uh, we found that solution at the moment. But but definitely nobody knows what will be in the in the near future. Maybe. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Now let's look a little bit to another corner of Europe, to Moldova. I really would like uh, to welcome. The Minister of Interior, Anna Redvenko, uh, being with us today. Of course, in the beginning of uh, the war in Ukraine, I think a uh, lot of spotlights were turned to Moldova in the situation there. So many uh, attention was paid, what is ongoing. Uh, yeah, after some time, as we know, uh, attention is going to another highlight here and there. <laughs> so. Moldova is not forgotten, but uh, a little bit, I think, uh, the attention is a different one. But the problems have been remaining in this country. So this huge number of refugees entering to Moldova, all those who are staying at the moment there, is a huge burden for the government. You have to organize a lot. So maybe you could give us a little bit uh, situation, how it is today, what is... Uh, the real issue that you are discussing within the country about refugees from Ukraine. Please, Madam Minister. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Director. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, indeed, even by looking at the title of this event, I would say that it fits very well the current uh, context. Well, uh, let me first tell you management of migration in turbulent times. Let me tell you first what is for Moldova the current definition of turbulent times after seven months. It's about multiple crises, overlapping crises. It's about global crises. It's about crises that change critically the context in just a matter of 24 hours and a change of over 180 degrees. It's crises that we have to manage and go far beyond the traditional mandate of what we used to know, home affairs or internal affairs. And now the word management, well, of course it goes with the words unity, responsibility, solidarity, and our first lessons learned, and uh, here comes our first also recommendations, is that it's definitely there is a huge need 
that we work together. And when I say work together, I mean within the jointly agreed and shared security boundaries, security borders. It's definitely the need that we critically redesign, reshape the response mechanisms. No longer we can work in silos, just, you know, vertically, but vertical specialization. It's not about the process, it's about the result. We don't have the luxury of time, nor the budgets to think about specific small things. It's about the way we share, we see and share, and we understand the common threats and therefore the common grounds. It's about the way and the critical need that we synchronize the actions. Synchronization should go beyond the borders of just one state. And it's not just the eastern or western border. It's about overall our jointly shared security border. It's about that we look, we have to develop our skills to look through the mirror. It's also about developing our strategic foresight capabilities. It's about the true need now to really ask ourselves, are we sufficiently holistic and comprehensive in our approach? Are we sufficiently engageful? And again, I will turn to what is known for us, the traditional mandate of home affairs or internal affairs. In these seven months, we learn to be the true leaders in the area of civil protection. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, we very much went into what once would have been mentioned as impossible in the area of security close to very much to the defense. With the bombing of Ukraine day before yesterday, and even today, some of these rockets, they transited the space of Moldova. It puts extra tasks, including on the shoulders, on the table, on the agenda of home affairs systems. So it's truly the time that we rethink what's a response mechanism. So it's far beyond the traditional, what we used to know, migration, migration for development. Is it time to think about migration for security or security and migration? What does it mean for all of us? Before concluding this, I would like to spot a few things. In February, Moldova was labeled as a country, small country, but with people with big hearts for the way we've helped the Ukrainians who were fleeing the war. In May, it became critically important when Moldova soil and Moldova borders became strategically important in order to restore the supply chain because of the closure of the airspace in Ukraine, because of the closure of the uh, marine infrastructure. Over 50% goes now through Moldova. Imagine the pressure on all our infrastructure that was in terms of processes and resources and everything was calibrated for peacetimes as all your resources. In our case, being with the war at the borders, receiving the first wave of everything, it means the capacity to react fast. Just one little thing I'll tell you, one first figure. It takes about 90, mi 90 minutes to drive from one border to another, from the eastern border, which is a border with the war, and the western border, which is a border with the EU. So when you hear the news about the bombing, we already have the first refugees at the border crossing points, and they already in need of accommodation, that's, that's of safe transportation. That is what I'm referring to when I'm talking about unity, shared security region and synchronization. In July, following after May, Moldova was recognized as a regional security provider by setting up the European Security Hub for Internal Security and Border Management in Chisinau. 
It was a decision supported by all the ministries of internal affairs of the member states and truly supported by Commissioner Johansson. In October, just now, the month we are in, Moldova is the, at the forefront of the European policy designed by being greater, greater the honor to host the next meeting of the European political community. It will be for the first time when Moldova will be hosting such an important event. And we take it both as honor, but also as responsibility. And the direct, straightforward, sincere sign that Moldova becomes a true contributor, provider of regional security. In my last point, I just want to share with you these thoughts of mine and my team in this morning. The European Union will win the confidence of the citizens of the European continent by the ways it treats the countries which share the same values, by the ways it endorses states bordering the war, and the way it supports countries representing the first line of defense of security by providing a robust shield contributing to the EU security ecosystem. Just a few questions for you to think about, take home and maybe debate here. Do you think that the escalation of the war based on the bombing as of day before yesterday, yesterday and this morning will increase the migration flows? Do you think that the energy breaks and cuts a very serious threat in my country could trigger migration flow? These are just few examples, few questions about the overlapping crisis that I was telling you from the very beginning. And that's exactly the right time that this conference comes and us all representing various segments of what we call migration, security, protection, European continent. And it's time that we already now take a very strong stand about the way we see our security and within it the role of migration in the days to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Minister, for these most interesting insights. I think, uh, of course, uh, there are, there is, this is food for thought also for the future. We will come later on uh, to discuss also expectations. And uh, I would like to continue looking now to a third different corner of Europe, coming to the Western Balkans. Minister of Interior of Austria this morning announced uh, about uh, this huge uh, influx now along the Western Balkan routes. So I think it's most interesting to hear also from Minister Selmo Cikotic, the Minister of Security of Bosnia-Herzegovina, well known also on the podium here in the Vienna Migration Conference. Uh, what is your uh, assessment at the moment? We know uh, this flow is not coming through Bosnia-Herzegovina. These are other ways, but of course, you are a very experienced minister for security for many years. You know quite well uh, about the Western Balkans. So please give us a little bit an insight how you see the situation at the moment. Please, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much, Mikhail, for inviting me here. And I would like to pass best regards from Sarajevo Migration Dialogue to Vienna Migration Conference. Uh, I feel at home here and I very much uh, have a strong sense of gratitude to Austria and ICMPD, you personally, for developing higher level of understanding because the simplified and um, reduced approach to migration caused a lot of troubles. And we still suffer from this simplicit approach. We live in a planet of migrations that have always been, are and will be the imminent part of world affairs, world international relations and world security, both international and national. And 
I very much appreciate the attitude that we need to deal with uh, root causes of migrations to prevent, reduce, exterminate the conflicts the starvation, the economic underdevelopment of certain regions uh, to reduce the migrations. But it is an instrument that could possibly reduce them, but will never stop them. So the, the conflicts are imminent part of human history and of the mankind, the, the, and conflicts do not necessarily produce only negative aspects. The conflicts are drivers of, of developments for a number of reasons. Uh, the Western Balkans, serving as a link between Europe and, and, and Middle East, Asia, North Africa, link between Occident and, and Orient, has got a very important role in the migration management. It does refer the responsibility, it does refer to solidarity, uh, but uh, it reflects the security of countries individually and the whole region and the wider parameter of, of affected, affected countries. Uh, Migration affects all areas of life. In our part of the world you could see direct political economic, but on the longer run, it produces effects on cultural, civilizational, religious, demographic, uh, artistic, and many other aspects of the life. More importantly, uh, the mig migration seen as a security threat, which they certainly are, uh, are interlinked with every other security challenge, risks, and threat. We heard about ecological aspects of it. We speak about organized crime, illegal trafficking in persons, uh, cyber threats, all kinds of corruptions, and many other aspects of, of security. Uh, so we need to have this comprehensive approach uh, translated into effective and simple actions on the ground. Uh, and I very much um, appreciate the work of ICMPD and support from Austrian government to Bosnia security institutions, which improved the deliverability and capacity to effectively manage the illegal migrations once they elevated the level of coordination, cooperation, and effective joint work of security system elements within Bosnia and Herzegovina with adjacent states, neighboring security uh, structures, and on bilateral basis with a number of, of states, Austria, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, and, and some other European partners, and a number of international organizations that were very instrumental and, and supportive. Uh, our experience we have got now is that this cooperation benefits all ends of cooperations. Uh, the investments of some partners into the capacity of Bosnian structures to fight, control and manage illegal migrations uh, on the territories of Bosnia and Herzegovina benefits the stability of Italy, of, of Austria, of Switzerland, Germany, Hungary and some other states affected by the flow and state of migrants on the territories of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we are now uh, developing that understanding on one side, and that's why we uh, saw the importance of Sarajevo migration dialogue, gathering many different viewpoints, experiences, and ideas, uh, processing them through the instruments of cooperation sometimes on multilateral and on some issues on bilateral levels. Uh, and parallel with that, we are constantly working on improvements of our practices to fight smugglers of illegal migrants, to fight corruption on one or the other side of the border, respectively. Uh, and this was 
one of the major reasons why we managed to significantly reduce the number of the migrants passing and staying on territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The mechanism of readmission agreements, which Bosnia and Herzegovina was the first one to, to conclude with the state of Pakistan, was, was positive. We pursued along this line, but we didn't manage to get other governments being ready. But what we managed over the course of this year, we have got three governments with fairly high number of illegal migrants coming from that accepted to work on SOP basis cooperation with Bosnia and Herzegovina, which means establishment of some kind of standing operational procedures. Uh, they accepted to send their government officials once we have got uh, substantial indications that we have got number of, of the migrants being there in, on, in our reception camps. They help the identification uh, and uh, the process of the organization of the transport back to their countries of origin. And I believe this is one of the good reasons uh, that, or the good examples that could be used uh, on the side of other interested countries. But again, the bi bilateral cooperation we now have got uh, assist us uh, on some pragmatic implementation of different issues. It's, I guess, important to say why I, sh I say this is a political uh, issue. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, we don't have the consensus of major political actors to uh, finance and, and jointly fight uh, these illegal migrations. But we compensate that lack uh, with good cooperation with some of the countries bilaterally or with good cooperation with some international organizations. Uh, and we are providing now uh, more effective instruments uh, which are showing that uh, the Bosnian route is not an easy one and, and comfortable one for, for the migrants. Keep in mind they are very well informed, very well co coordinated, and the smugglers that do the transit and, and, and make a lot of money on the fate of these poor people uh, are also well coordinated. They cooperate much better than the security structures across the borders of respective countries. They don't care for political disagreements. They don't care for ethnic, religious, national, and other differences. Uh, as long as there is interest, will of migrants to pay, uh, their will to cooperate in, in taking money and in an easy fashion is, is always there. But once we have shown that we have identified them, started apprehending them, their work was reduced immensely in a very short period of time. And I guess this kind of cooperation and approach uh, is very instrumental and application of some European mechanisms uh, to our part of the world um, is something that is badly needed. We see ourselves as part of Europe in some um, institutional and, and formal reasons the EU does not. But we have got migrants coming from EU, passing through our part of the world, and headed towards other parts of EU. I, I guess EU has got some good reasons to apply some, not just Frontex and border control mechanisms, intelligence exchange, security structures, cooperation at a higher level, but also to imply some of the uh, pragmatic, at the same time, principal uh, standardization mechanisms of, that exist and work in Europe to our part of the world. Not just because of us, but because of EU itself. I, I guess the benefits are going to inevitably improve the migration management uh, practice uh, at the whole territory of, of EU. As long as they feel um, safe, and, 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 and successful in applying some uh, deviation or uh, 
avoidance of EU mechanism on our part of the world, they will continue to use the advantages of, of those practices and, and realities. We are very much willing to uh, further cooperate and share experience on some small details that we believe are very important. Principal solutions are much stronger when they include the small uh, practical experiences and knowledge from the ground and we are willing to share and we very much appreciate the invitation of Vienna Migration Conference and we believe that your presence at Sarajevo Migration Dialogue in the future will continue to be at even higher level. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister, especially also giving us a little bit an update about the progress that has been made in the past. So, now let me welcome together with you uh, Germany and the representative of Germany, Mr. Mahmoud Özdemir. He is the Parliamentary State Secretary uh, in the Ministry of the Interior and Community. And uh, of course, we are very much looking forward to hear from you or your assessment what is about Ukraine crisis uh, happening in Germany. And maybe you could also give us a little bit an insight about the new government of Germany. Uh, what I've read in the coalition um, agreement was there should be a new start on migration and integration policies that are worthwhile for a modern immigration country. Also, this is something very interesting. Mm -hmm. Please, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear Mr. Spindelegger, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and first of all, many thanks to you, Mr. Spindelegger, for the invitation and for hosting this conference, which we are following with particular interest, not only but also because Germany holds the chair of the IPCMD steering group this year. And um, very thanks for the important and impressive statements, uh, dear colleagues on this panel, and it gives me the opportunity to react uh, to these statements uh, in case. In June, together with the ICMPD, we organized a high-level international mid-term event to the Vienna Migration Conference <coughs> on Europe's protection challenge, preparing for the next stage in Berlin, focusing on the migration situation after the Russian war on Ukraine, after the Russian aggression on Ukraine, and our response to it unitedly. This issue is, of course, still on the agenda. The current situation, unfortunately, does not give any reason to give the all clear. We're talking about partial mobilization, annexation of Ukrainian territories in violation of international law following fake referendums. Russia's attack on Ukraine has triggered the largest migration movement since World War II. Germany is currently offering protection to one million people from Ukraine, all registered in our foreign register. All of us in Germany and the other host countries can be proud of how we have managed together to respond quickly and unitedly to this situation. But today we also want to broaden our view and talk more comprehensively about the consequences of numerous global crises on our national and European migration policies. You specifically ask about the federal government's new migration strategy. To begin with, uh, we are indeed aiming for a new beginning in migration and integration policy, a comprehensive modernization of immigration law that does justice to our diverse country of migration. Just bring it to one sentence. We will give chances to people who come to us and we will give them the chance to stay and live legally in our countries, but we will, still f we will want to still fight people who come illegally and they have to return, but not exclusively with this point of view just on return, we want to give them chances to come legally and so reduce this illegal migration. Worldwide migration and also migration to Germany as an attractive country is not new. The topic is permanent concern to us and will remain so. Our claim is to shape migration to Germany in a forward-looking and realistic way. People rightly expect this from politics. But let me first say a few words about the current mig migration situation. In addition to migration from Ukraine, we are currently observing increased general migration dynamics, as we mentioned in the conference. 
not only in Germany, but overall at the US, ex US external borders, we are experiencing a sharp increase in irregular migration this year, to which the movements via the Balkan route contribute significantly. Although the numbers increase every year in summer and autumn, we see a higher dynamic this year compared to the previous years. On the one hand, this is due to the catch-up effects after the travel restrictions due to the corona pandemic. In addition, there is a precarious economic and domestic political situation in classical host or transit countries such as Turkey, Tunisia, Libya. In addition, new routes or modi operandi to Europe are emerging. The Balkan region remains the main route of secondary migration from Greece and Turkey via Bulgaria towards Central and Western Europe. Almost half of all illegal border crossings at the EU or Schengen external borders this year took place via the Western Balkan route, 70 of 155,000. This is a significant increase compared to the previous years in relation to the Balkan region. It is an inc increase of more than 200%. Border police apprehensions in Germany are also increasing significantly. As of uh, this year in September, 50,000. There were total in the year 2021, 57,000, just to compare these both figures. The German-Czech border has become a focal point in, in case. The main countries of origin still remain Syria, Afghanistan, Turkey and Iraq. In addition to the overland route, the air route is also becoming increasingly important. And therefore, Serbia, Serbia's deviations from the visa acquis are therefore a topic to talk about. And it's, I think it's worth talking about in this conference here. We believe that we should achieve an alignment on, of visa exemption policies of all Western Balkan countries with the EU visa acquis. So, what is our strategy to both meet German needs and priorities and deal with future migration crisis? In migration policy, we are making a paradigm shift. We will amend the Residence Act, especially on the right to stay, as I mentioned. In addition, we will introduce an opportunity right of residence, which has already been approved by the government in the cabinet. Among other things, we will facilitate the immigration of skilled workers through a point system and apply blue card regulations to urgently needed non-academic skilled workers. Of course, we also stand by our humanitarian responsibility for refugees. In the area of asylum, building on recent progress, we are working within the European Union for a fair distribution of responsibility and solidarity between EU member states and compliance with the EU law. At the national level, we will present a draft law for better and faster decisions in asylum procedures, as well as an acceleration of court proceedings, in particular by standardizing jurisdiction. This bill also provides for the abolition of the regular review of revocation procedures in a favor way of review of asylum decisions only and on ad hoc basis. Furthermore, asylum procedure counseling independent of the authorities is to be introduced in Germany. Before Christmas 22, corresponding legislative packages, as I mentioned before, are planned in the area of asylum and migration and will take place in the parliament, hopefully. Further changes in the asylum law, especially regarding vulnerable persons, as well as the introduction of a point system for skilled workers, among other things, are to take place before summer break 2023. Within the framework of a repatriation of offensive, we want to remove obstacles to the termination of the residence of persons who are obliged to leave the country. In particular, criminals and dangerous persons are to be returned more frequently. Migration partnerships with the countries of origin for which a special representative is to be appointed are also to include cooperation on return, as well as, for example, economic cooperation, technology transfer, visa facilitation and qualification measures for the German labor market. We also 
taking a new direction in integration. The current legal situation links access to an integration course to at least the prospect of a right to stay. In future, access to integration methods should no longer depend on this. In accordance with the provisions of the coalition agreement, an ongoing bill will be enable all asylum seekers to access integration courses within the framework of free places. The current draft law provides for access for asylum seekers irrespective of their country of origin. For me, these elements of a modern immigration law are closely related. For our modern and humanitarian immigration policy, we need the acceptance of the German people, but also the people in Europe. For this, it is important that people without the right to stay with us actually return to their home countries or are to be returned. But we examine every request for protection very carefully. From my point of view, the earlier creation of incentives for desired immigration, integration opportunities, easier access to the labor market, and also special efforts in forced return and the promotion of voluntary return are essential changes of direction. We are modernizing immigration law to adapt it to the needs of the 21st century, and that's what we do in Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. State Secretary, especially for sharing with us what the new German government uh, will do within the next years. And um, talking about the future, I think uh, it would be in a second round uh, good just to hear about expectations, what has to be done. We are discussing now in Europe for several years this pact on migration and asylum. Yeah, some parts of it were picked out and decided, like this new EU asylum agency. And we are very much proud also to welcome uh, the Director General, uh, Nina Gregory, here with us. But uh, of course, the whole concept remains to be decided because there is no agreement at the moment. But what are the needs? And we would like, I think, to hear also from you a little bit what are your expectations for this EU asylum uh, architecture for the future. And maybe we could start with you, Anna, because, uh, of course, Moldova needs a lot of support. There was this uh, support platform created. Maybe you could give us uh, some information about the immediate needs, uh, more in a principal point of view, uh, what Moldova expects from Europe in the future. Thank you for the question. Uh, I feel that uh, I'm still looking at the time, but I feel that in order for, uh, for me to better transmit the, the message about our needs is to first dedicate a couple of minutes to giving you the current picture, where do we stand, what's the current situation in Moldova again, because, because we are bordering the war. Uh, I was telling earlier uh, that our resources, our mechanism, our systems, as uh, any system, was calibrated for peace times, right? But uh, to make the figures, the current figures, that our systems are supposed to accommodate and uh, make them still functional for the uh, uh, well-being and for the uh, safety of the people, I'll give you a few uh, data. Moldova has the longest border with the war. Uh, I mean, those who are uh, confronting with the war consequences. It's over 50% of our border length with the war. One third of it, we don't have effective control because of Transnistria. In just, we still have Russian troops on our soils, and they are so-called protecting the biggest deposit of munitions. It's for 30 years there. So these are the current realities, and they do have to be considered in the equation when we are talking about the threats and the needs. Just in the first weeks since February 24th, we have processed over half a million of entries at the border. It's an unprecedented number. And remember, we were calibrated for peace times. And when I got the call four in the morning saying, Madam Minister, 
the war has started, we didn't have too much time. Remember, I was telling you, being at the border, it means that in the first minutes, we started to see that the queue at the border is increasing. We don't have the luxury of time of uh, shaping, coordinating, authorizing, uh, pre-assessing, assessing, evaluating, piloting, testing, whatever word comes to your mind, the mechanism response. You have to be there because the person is there. In just the few, these weeks, basically because of this number, the population of Moldova has increased by almost 4%. All of those who work in the area of home and internal affairs, you definitely understand what kind of pressure is that on the police forces as well, in terms of safety on the roads, safety in communities. We have our own struggle in the country regarding uh, pro-Brussels, pro-Moscow, pro-war or not. Showing solidarity with refugees was also a thing to consider, and that's definitely a threat to consider also for, for the public order forces. Also, the highest number, I was telling you, when the population has increased by 4%, the highest number of refugees who uh, we had to organize safe accommodation and the minimum standards of living, 4% increase, 120,000. We still have over 80,000 of refugees on, uh, on our soil. Over half of them are children. Now, from the uh, minimum needs perspective, access to education, access to health care, access to social protection, access to labor markets, of course, probably we have an advantage as compared to other countries because we are still, all of us, we speak the same language. So the so-called integration is easier, it's more facilitated. We are still connected by friendship ties, by relatives, so it's easier, but only from one perspective. When it comes again to such eminent needs, such as access to health care for <coughs> pregnant women, and we had an unprecedented increase, in the number of uh, babies. They compensate the, the drama that uh, my teams in the field are going through when it comes to, to assistance, but nevertheless, it's there. Access to education, how do you organize education for over 40,000 children of different age in a language that they do not speak, in safe conditions? Winter is coming, we're talking about heating. How do we do that? When uh, Moldova is under threat of going into a very serious energetic crisis. We registered over almost 10,000 asylum applications. This is in the context when previously we had maximum 100 a year, and now almost 10,000. Of course, it's a pressure on our migration and asylum specialists. A boom in the number of illegal border crossings and attempts to violate the border, the state borders. Over two and a half thousand people. We also have attempts for violation of the state border by persons that come from far regions. Remember, I was telling you earlier, because of the closure of the uh, marine infrastructure that in the past was used to smuggle people, including into Europe. Now Moldova is being seen as a possible transit region. After the mobilization declared in Russia, because we are bordering with the EU, it's also considered as a possible region to reroute the smuggling. So it's again, it's an extra pressure on our borders. These are just a few examples I, I was planning to give you in terms of where do we stand? Are we ready for a second wave? Yes, we must be ready for any scenarios. We've seen how the situation is changing quickly, how, how the context is volatile during these seven months. We, we believe that we reasonably well managed to, to address these challenges because of the four tools we managed to put together, and we never had them before. It's those kinds of complexity contingency plans that are based on real case scenarios, that are constantly adapted, changed, adjusted to the changes in the context. And this is done by a group of analysts that are still operational 24-7. And 
what we've seen, all of us, yesterday and today will definitely change the scenarios. It means, again, adapting the contingency plan. We've changed definitely the way we model uh, our operations in field. We no longer have solo specialists. We worked in mixed teams. So it's like the police is helping the border police, and both of them are helping the migration specialist teams. Have you ever seen that before? Yes, no, maybe some. But again, it's, it's proof that we can no longer work in silos, as I was telling you earlier. We also completely changed the way we, we understand and we do patrolling work, community policing work, uh, securing the safety in the context when we have this increase of population, but also the tension in the society that we are now also having an increase and we are seeing now a continuous routes on the street that are called to rather increase the tension and increase the, the, the disorders. Of course, speaking of results, we put together temporary field camps, but the houses of people continue to be open and we have to secure that these field camps are fully autonomous. Yes, there is a need because we need to be prepared for a possible second wave. We opened, believe it or not, temporary bus and railway stations, and we had to do that again in a matter of days, not months. So we didn't have the luxury of multi-stakeholder coordination going up and down as a usual procedure would be. It's about the way we've synchronized the actions at one border, eastern border, with the other border. There have been days when I was feeling that me and my team, we are sort of operating the, a massive, the biggest border crossing point of EU. That was the way we're managing this response mechanism throughout the whole territory of Moldova. What was happening on the east would definitely be felt on the west in just a matter of, 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 of hours. Because of this distance, because it's easy, because of Transnistria, we also had to think about this internally displaced people uh, component. It's definitely important to consider 90 minutes from two. It's definitely important to consider that we are talking not only about passengers, uh, people, we are talking about cars and we're talking about cargo trucks. The need is to increase the resilience of the authorities and systems that are there and providing this support, immediate, mid-term and long-term support for refugees. Refugees stay in, in people's homes, so it's about the capacity to have heating for these homes. Refugees, Ukrainians, they're accessing health systems. It's about increase the capacity of the health system to accommodate the needs of the refugees. Of course, I just brought you few figures for you to understand what kind of pressure is on the home affairs. We're no longer traditional home affairs. We are opening new border crossing points. We are building infrastructure. Believe it or not, we are building bridges. And it's on the plate of the home affairs. We do not have some secret reserves. We can only rely on our resources and procedures, equipment and people. We are very happy and proud to have Frontex with us but just a pair of hands is not enough. We have assessed our needs. We have shared with many uh, partner countries. The need is still there. The space for increased capabilities is still there. The solidarity platform that was put together with the uh, agreement of several countries, it's Germany, it's Romania, and the next solidarity platform will be conducted in Paris. I very much hope that the participants at the working group dedicated to border management and internal security will be attended by a much bigger number of, of member states who share the same need to secure our common space, who understand that we are facing common threats and who understand, and I'm sure that all of you understand, that we need to work for common security regions. That would mean enabling Moldova to really serve as a protection, as a security belt, 
at the eastern flank of, of Europe, and particularly when it comes to taking the first waves, when it comes to the first consequences of the war, including from the threats of organized crime associated usually with, with the wars. And we will yet to be seeing the long-term consequences of, of, of it. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Minister. This is really a long list, and I think we could talk much more about this, mm -hmm. but uh, we have got your message. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Minister, what would you expect? You said in your first statement you believe uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is part of this European architecture, and uh, of course, uh, your expectations, please. Uh, I've also already stated uh, we don't expect the migrations to uh, get down to the extent that we could ignore them. Quite opposite, I would rather expect an increased number of illegal migrants. And we need to keep in mind that now, for the last few years, hundreds, if not thousands of them, ended up their lives in the waters of Mediterranean or at the hills or values of the Balkans. So most of them are aware of the danger along the way from the countries of their origin to the countries of their destiny. But they still, for uh, probably obvious reasons, uh, take that risk uh, and they uh, look for better future and better living conditions in countries of uh, primarily Western and uh, Northern Europe. I was visiting Lipa camp with Ambassador Sattler and we talked to one of the young Pakistanis who told us that he had been returned seven times from Milano to, to Lipa. <laughs> Seeing it as kind of ridiculous position, mm -hmm. we ask him then, what are you hoping for? <laughs> are you, will you continue to, to, to opt? And he said, of course, and I will make as many attempts as it takes, because I have already got two brothers in Germany, and I will join them. And I know I will, I will do so, and then we'll start the kind of, of new life together. So uh, our assumption is not the presence or absence of the migration, but rather much more a level and quality of our domestic and international security system organization and our capacity to be in control of that process. That's why I'm um, advocating so strongly uh, the extended and strengthened level of the cooperation of not just security structures. It takes the cooperation of healthcare professionals, educational professionals, even some, some academic structures uh, on a number of issues. And yet, we see uh, the, the benefits. Everyone likes to be part of success, but people are reluctant to come into a risky operations until they see that this might and will produce a success. So we don't need to uh, disseminate this atmosphere of fear associated with migrations in many respects, but rather our focus on our capabilities and our capacity to effectively control, manage and govern them for the well-being of our own citizens, our own states, the regions we belong to, but also for the benefits of those who elect to come and pass through our territories or stay at the camps uh, on, on our territories. We have got the experience of last few years in Bosnia-Herzegovina that are proving this is possible. Migrants are willing to cooperate, even though they do not have the ID cards we very often have got deep reserves about the, their names and their identity, uh, even the countries of origin. Uh, but once they see the benefits of, of cooperating with us, uh, 
if they see a good motivation to cooperate with us, then they do so. And, and we are now developing those small mechanisms to encourage and increase the level of their openness and cooperation within our reception centers, with our managements. Uh, and we have recently undergone a big transition. We have took over the responsibility of this process from international community and organizations that were present there. We made the change of the migration crisis into the migration situation, which is a significant change. Two years ago, it was the major topic in media in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now, nobody speaks about migrations. Nobody even sees them or talks, talk about them. Uh, but I am trying to encourage you to understand that migrants, regardless of uh, attitude we initially used to have or have got now against them or towards them, are willing to be part of the solution mechanisms if we provide them a good ground, motivation mechanisms, and the possibility to uh, explore. And again, the functions of national systems, international cooperation, and cooperation of Europe with our part of the world, the, the, the elastic and, and, and adoptable application of EU Pact on Migration and Asylum Policy, as well as support of some regional uh, organizations that are dealing with, with these issues uh, will certainly benefit both the security of the region and security uh, of the Europe as a whole. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. If we are turning to you, I would like, of course, to hear your expectation about the pact. I think we are discussing this for years now. Uh, do you think we need some new elements because of situation in Ukraine? just to adapt it uh, before a decision is made about this. May I ask you first, Mr. Deputy Minister? Uh, sure, we're discussing more than six years about, uh, about PACT, and <laughs> so the light in the tunnel hope to be uh, reached in the moment. Uh, what I want to stress that uh, perhaps this more comprehensive uh, uh, package of, of different amendments need to be taken. And uh, our Belarusian crisis uh, shows that um, uh, we need as well, and uh, together with European Commission, there's proposed amendments in some regulations. First uh, is amendment in the Schengen Border Code, because whole Schengen area is affected, not, not only one country. There's a great value, uh, Schengen, Schengen um, zone. And uh, therefore, uh, legislation to change, uh, to uh, legitimize uh, physical infrastructure is a key essential. Uh, the second regulation now on the way to the European Parliament is regulation or addressing instrumentalization of migration, where need to be uh, taken such situation and in Belarus uh, with uh, with uh, addressing, uh, addressing longer procedures, uh, perhaps different procedures, uh, how to avoid abusing on common European asylum system. That's a key importance. And of course, fact. Uh, our country, Lithuania, is uh, supporting a step-by-step approach, uh, taking different, uh, different, uh, regula different directives and regulations, of course. What I want to stress, the key importance on returns. From the very beginning, uh, uh, we last year with, with the Belarusian, uh, Be Belarusian um, influx via Belarusia, uh, we um, fully transparent invited Frontex, invited as well uh, EASO at such time, that time uh, now asylum agency with the, uh, the officers uh, to make uh, some uh, European approach, uh, European Union approach to all the system. And I want to stress that um, uh, we did uh, a lot of efforts with the third countries to, to try to, to convince third countries. For example, 80% of those refugees were from Iraq. Uh, no, migrants, regular migrants, not the refugees maybe. Very 5% only, only were considered as, a, as, a, as a refugees. And we started mutual cooperation with Iraq, with uh, inviting the consulars uh, to, uh, 
uh, to issue the travel documents for them, and it, it succeeded. We returned voluntary more than 25% with the support of Frontex uh, and some financial uh, benefits for, for those who want to uh, return. So uh, it seems that it's possible to do that, those uh, returns. And uh, only we need stronger cooperation with the third countries and the, the new uh, the new system uh, of MOCADEM should be as well actively used to find individual solution targeted measures to make an impact based on the flexibility. That one is the key importance. Another, uh, another for example, uh, approach we have used is uh, border prolonging border procedure. So far we, we used about six months border procedure with so-called uh, no, legal fixture of no entry. And it helped, of course, uh, because if we will, a border procedure would uh, take for, for, for a few weeks only, uh, Lithuania is not, uh, let's say, target country of migrants. Uh, my colleagues on the left <laughs> definitely know that there is, <laughs> he represented the, the target country on the secondary immigration. But we take that burden and sometimes the criticism uh, criticism from the different NGO organization and, uh, and uh, fulfill that border procedure up to six months. So far, what was it done during those six months? We made contacts with the third countries as Iraq and convinced uh, about 25% of, of those irregular migrants convinced to return back home because they were promised uh, very easy to cross the border. You're taking air flight, uh, paying some uh, money for the visa for the smugglers and within the two days you will be in the European Union and they even not know that they are in Lithuania. They, they believe they're in Germany already because smugglers say it's, uh, it is, everything is done. So far, it's a comprehensive approach, what I want to stress uh, in, the, uh, in, in the pack. And step by step, uh, we need to, uh, to go to that direction and uh, with uh, very, let's say, uh, very <laughs> short perspective need to be taken because we need to prepare for such situation of instrumentalization as well. Now, Ukraine a little bit different, uh, different case because uh, is um, a triggered uh, directive on temporary protection. Of course, it will be prolonged perhaps, but uh, definitely that's, uh, it will be finished one day when the war will be over and Ukraine will win. So, <laughs> so hopefully that, that scenario will, will, will be done. But anyway, anyway uh, all possibilities, uh, uh, what we have talked in the first stages, uh, for example, even the climate change, some one or other way need to be reflected in, in that comprehensive approach on, on, on the pact. So let's see. Uh, European Commission as well, member state doing their best uh, how to find solutions and hope that near uh, presidencies, next year presidencies, uh, maybe, uh, maybe helped with that. With that. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Minister. Mr. State Secretary, you see this maybe with fresh eyes, <laughs> not being involved in five years' discussion. Yeah. Maybe you can give you, uh, us some... Uh, expectations from your perspective? Fresh eyes is the grace of being born in 1987. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, as I heard my colleagues talk about it, I just um, remembered my parents when we are, I come from Duisburg, when we uh, drove to the Netherlands, for example, for me, uh, I just drove there. It was for me Europe, it was not Germany, it was not uh, Netherlands, it was home. And um, just regarding, and I want to make two remarks on this, um, border controls or physically uh, controls. We have to put a um, headline on it, I think. Uh, and the headline is uh, security and freedom. And uh, another word which is very um, important is dignity. Our constitution in Germany begins with the untouchable dignity of uh, uh, persons, um, and I think we have to uh, look what we are doing there. And uh, what we are doing is fighting crime. Fighting crime means we are doing this border controls, and I discussed it with my Austrian uh, colleague uh, as well. It's a necessary thing to do to fight crime. 
what we want to do is we want to make we have chances and that's a European idea I think the European idea is more important to have a common migration code to, to, to tell the people from all over the world when you want to come to Europe mm -hmm. they are one two three you have to fulfill these conditions and you can come to Europe you can study you can work you can have your flat and that's the second remark I wanted to make um, Ukrainian people what is the secret in Germany to have this social peace the social peace comes from from the first second when the person from Ukraine comes to Germany and when he or she is registered he has a complete introduction in our social welfare to the labor market to school to uh, kindergarten, everything, and uh, integration courses and uh, learning language is very important. I think we should more stress on this migration conferences uh, uh, language skills and uh, make programs for integration, for language. Uh, English is very important, uh, uh, as we see, and uh, the, the best integration point uh, are the children, I think. Children in school, children don't have any doubts about other children, children don't have any uh, concerns and uh, don't for, for children it doesn't matter if you're black if you're white if, uh, if you have another religion I think that's the code and that's the key but uh, back to the standards to your questions after this uh, two remarks and um, I answered your first question uh, relatively extensively and uh, I know that but uh, I want to have a few uh, minutes of your audience uh, in case just to return to a brief, uh, rather brief uh, answer to your um, view uh, in this advanced time. The current crisis and in uh, particular the current situation uh, related to the war in Ukraine and the significant uh, refugee movement associated with this in case once brought us to the attention that uh, we need uh, the CS, I think. It's a common European asylum system. We have to uh, put uh, huge uh, amounts uh, of ideas, not money huge amount of ideas uh, in this CS to have a common European idea how we can uh, give people in Europe or coming to Europe the chance to stay here. The agreement reached under the French presidency, I think, on the first stage of the step-by-step -step approach, as my colleague uh, mentioned in the Council, is a great success after a very long period of time in deadlock uh, on the mm -hmm. CS. And this agreement has shown that compromises among EU member states is possible and that they stay together. We should build on this progress to move the reform forward, I think. The task now is to convince the European Parliament in each member state to unblock the package approach and in particular to start the negotiations with the EP on the screening and the Eurodac uh, regulations. And that is what I mean with uh, security uh, and freedom in the headlines uh, just regarding the dignity of the people. We have to uh, safe uh, legal migration and we have to fight criminals, Criminal. I think. In this context, we very much welcome that the, fa the fact that the European Parliament and the Council Presidencies have agreed on a common roadmap until the end of legislative, which is quite near. Uh, we have 22 and uh, 2024, uh, the next elections will uh, take place and a successful result is important and possible if all actors cooperate constructively and I think the uh, YMC, uh, VMC, <laughs> excuse me, uh, could be a, a milestone on this way mm -hmm. when we act together and we went when we want to uh, go this way together. It is also important to implement the agreed voluntary solidarity mechanism in practice and uh, here uh, I am and uh, Germany stands by its pledge uh, of 3,500 persons and is ready to support the southern external border states under this mechanism and in particular to take on asylum seekers rescued from distress at sea and I think this could be a solution for uh, the Western Balkan route as well, not to uh, return or uh, reject people, just having a legal way to come to Europe. And uh, this solidarity mechanism and uh, distribution all over the member states uh, of migrants uh, can be the solution. Germany supports, uh, and uh, I will emphasize this, the Czech uh, Council Presidency in continuing the step-by-step -step approach. Committed work must also continue in the Council on the second stage, uh, further reform steps. In doing so, we continue to strive uh, for a balance between responsibility 
and this solidarity mechanism. And the work on the CS reform continues uh, with the appropriate political will. We will make, um, I think, an important or a further progress. And as I said, the current situation shows once again how necessary, how necessary this is to have the CS and the solidarity mechanism to put uh, uh, in uh, two solutions uh, in this discussion which will solve and, and from my point of view this are the most important uh, ways to solve the migration problem. Thank you very much Mr. State Secretary. I have now a good and a bad message to you. <laughs> the good message is we had a real rich discussion here on the podium. I thank you very much for all the insights. I think it was most interesting to hear from outside European Union, inside European Union, uh, about uh, state of play, but also about expectations. The bad message is we are running out of time. Yeah. We don't have uh, any time for discussion within the room. Uh, so I think starting that, I know then we have 10 questions and there is no time to answer. So I would propose to you that we leave it with that and that we are going now to the next point, and this is, I think, Marlin, uh, to have a break for lunch. Please, Marlin, and give an applause to our members on the podium. Thank you very much.